Well, college basketball is back, and now you can hear our thoughts on the National Player of the Year and who is going to win it all in our bold, bold, bold predictions <laughs> episode. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, a five-time-a-week national college hoop show, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It is only our second episode. It's so exciting to be going in this first week of the college basketball season. I am Isaac Shea, joined by our second host, Mr. Andy Patton. We are here with you, and today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. And some of those props uh, from Bet Online, where the game starts, might help you make some bold predictions this college basketball season. And that's what we're talking about today. So keep in mind, bold predictions are exactly that bold. They are things that should not go right if everything <laughs> happens as it ought to. But that's what's fun about it is predicting the unpredictable, which is exactly what sports is. So today, Andy and I are each going to give you three bold predictions, one per segment, that are sure to go wrong and that you're <laughs> going to come back and expose us on Cold Takes Exposed. But you know what? If we get like one out of six right, we're doing pretty good, I would say. So Andy... With that said, I'm going to let you be the first victim here and get us going with your first bold prediction for the 2022-23 college basketball season. Yeah, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of people who had St. Peter's going to the Elite Eight. So, hey, you know what? You <laughs> never know. You make your bold predictions. Maybe maybe you'll strike lightning in a bottle one time. Um, so my first prediction here is about a Pac-12 player. It is about Pella Larson for the Arizona Wildcats. Uh, I'm predicting that Pella Larson wins Pac-12 player of the year. Ooh. And he was not even, so the Pac-12, like a couple conferences have been doing lately, they seemed to think that the first team, all <laughs> Pac-12 honorees is 10 players, which seems a little odd to me. The WCC does this as well. There are a lot of conferences that SCC do this. Did that this year, I noticed. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picking on the Pac-12 a little bit, but the fact that Pella Larson wasn't selected to the first team Pac-12, he wasn't one of the top 10 players picked out of the Pac-12 conference was definitely surprising to me. Larson was the sixth man of the year last year in the Pac-12 conference in his first year under coach Tommy Lloyd at Arizona. He averaged just over seven points, about three and a half boards and two assists per game. Really, really high level score. He's good score around the rim, good score from beyond the arc shot, 36% from deep. Over 80% from the free throw line point is when this guy has the basketball in his hands, he finds a way to put it in the net. Uh, he's a good distributor, a decent rebounder as well. And he was in a very, very different role last year that he's going to be in this year. You yeah. might recall the Arizona Wildcats last year, Ben Matherin, Dallin Terry, Christian Coloco, all three of those guys are in the NBA now, really, really talented Arizona team. They bring back some really talented players. Kirk Creesa is back at the point guard position for Tommy Lloyd. Uh, you have uh, Omar Balo is going to step into a starting role in the center spot after Coloco's absence. And then you have Larson. And Larson's going to kind of have to take on a much bigger role. I think that Arizona's kind of missing that like go-to super high-level score. Mm -hmm. They have Azulis Tabellis, who I think, quite frankly, has a, a, a – more clear path to being the Pac-12 <laughs> player of the year than Larson does. Uh, Tubelis is 6'9", guard, can do things that not a lot of people his size can do. I think he's he's an extraordinarily talented player, of course. You also have Jaime Jaquez from UCLA. He's going to be a, just a monster this season. you got Will Richardson at Oregon, Drew Peterson at US, USC, Tiger Campbell, of course, at UCLA as well. Really, really talented crop of players in the Pac-12. But for me, Pella Larson is right in that mix as well. If he gets more aggressive hunting his own shot, uh, if he can go out there and have a really, really strong season on both ends of the floor, I think there's a reasonable chance he's in that conversation. Man, that's a great start to the bold predictions, Andy Patton, because this guy does not, I mean, Tiger Campbell, right? Like mm -hmm. any, any, even he, somebody mm -hmm. off the radar like that, but you're going off the radar and I'm here <laughs> for it. Yep. I, it makes sense though. I see the path that you mm -hmm. have laid out. Like, uh, I think most people, as the AP poll does, would have UCLA as the top team in the mm -hmm. Pac-12. I think they're preseason eight, and uh, Arizona mm -hmm. is preseason 17. But, uh, like, the second team in the Pac-12. And so you look mm -hmm. at who's going to be that go-to, like you talked mm -hmm. about in the best player. No reason to think that Mr. Larson couldn't be that. Yep. 
Well, uh, for me, I'm going to start with a player prediction as well, and I'm going to go back down south to the SEC, uh, and it's going to be kind of a two-parter. Oscar Sheway, reigning national player of the year, a uh, little banged up, little some knee issues. Uh, it's even um, going to be interesting to see how he does to start the season here these first couple weeks. How is he going to play? But because of that is why I'm going with this bold prediction. He averaged 15.2 <laughs> rebounds a game last year. Absolutely absurd. But he is on record saying, I want 20 this year. And I'm going to say that Oscar Shibwe does it, banged up knee and all. Uh, <laughs> like, and, and I think it makes sense because his teammates know he's going for it. And so they're going to like, hey, mm-hmm. there's a rebound and we're both going for it. Yep. Let me pull back Xavier Wheeler or whoever it is right. and let Mr. Shibwe get this rebound so we can get those numbers up. And so I would love to see. I mean, absolutely a crazy, ridiculous number to see. Really excited to see he and Armando Baycott, uh, two Mm -hmm. of the best rebounders in the country, do it. Mm -hmm. But the more bold part of it is I am going to say that he does not repeat as National Player of the Year. Uh, Why is that? Well, two things. Based on history, Mm -hmm. we have not had a repeat Naismith National Player of the Year since 1981, 2, and 3, when Virginia's Ralph Sampson, one of the best dudes to ever play the game, uh, won this award three straight years. But that's four decades ago, Andy, that we had a repeat uh, National Player of the Year. And so history says to me, is, is against Shibwe. Give, give me mm-hmm. the field or Oscar Shibwe. I want the field. Mm-hmm. But the other reason I would go against him is because Drew Timmy at Gonzaga yeah. um, just has all of this possibility of mm-hmm. um, the, the, the the no more Chet Holmgren of it all, yeah. right? They're, they're battling so much for stat lines last year. Mm-hmm. And Drew Timmy is going to dominate just about every game or should mm-hmm. uh, obviously in the early part of the season, when Gonzaga is beefing up that non-conference schedule to yep. make up for WCC play, mm-hmm. he's still going to put up numbers, but my goodness, it's going to be crazy what he does in the West coast conference. Um, and so give me drew Timmy as the national player of the year, replacing Mr. Oscar Sheboy. I love it. I, I think, you know, obviously there's more players than just Timmy and Shuwe in that conversation as well. You're, Armando Baycott, certainly in the conversation. Marcus Sasser at Houston is going to be in there. Hunter Dickinson from Michigan. There's a handful of other guys. Uh, but I, I think you, you you mentioned it with Timmy. Like, I think a lot of the time it's going to be Drew Timmy and four shooters on the court at the same time. And when you talk about college basketball and the big lane in the middle and how much room those big guys have to operate, you put him on a team with four shooters, he's going to do some work. My goodness. You love, you love to see it. Well, uh, we're going to keep going with our bold predictions. Next one's coming up in just a second, right after we tell you about Nissan. This week's thrilling moment in college basketball is brought to you by Nissan. The thrilling designs behind the new lineup from Nissan are intended to empower drivers in vehicles as capable as the drivers themselves. And when I think of unbelievable abilities on the court for this week's thrilling moment, we got to go back to last season's NCAA tournament. And you might think I'm going North Carolina and Duke in the final four. No, sir, Bob. It is hard to imagine anything more thrilling than what Shaheen Holloway and the St. Peter's Peacocks did in the NCAA tournament. They knocked off two seed Kentucky. They knocked off seven seed Murray State, the fight in Ja Morantz. And then they knocked off third seeded Purdue with Travion Williams and Zach Eady. Unbelievable before they finally fell in the Elite Eight to North Carolina. Great run from St. Peter's. Can't wait to see who this year's St. Peter's is that can provide us another thrilling moment. This segment has been inspired by the thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all-new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. All available right now at NissanUSA.com. All right, Mr. Patton. So we've got our first bold predictions under the belt. Would love to see any of that remotely come true, but it won't. Uh, But that's okay, because now we are going to get into our second bold prediction. So I'll just keep the train rolling here and then we'll throw it to you. So for me, we're going to go to a conference and a team 
this time. We're going to go to the Big East and Villanova, who we talked about on yesterday's show, if you were with us. If you didn't, you should go back and check that out, Mm -hmm. that Villanova is without Jay Wright. Now, Kyle Neptune comes in as the new coach, and so here's what I'm thinking. The Big East, we had this monster, crazy, awesome Big East that we all followed for so many years until like a bunch of those teams up and left to go to the ACC. Miami, Pitt, Notre Dame, Syracuse, Louisville, all of them. And so here is my prediction. For the first time since the Big East lost all of those teams, Villanova is going to go back-to-back seasons without winning at least a share of the Big East regular season title. So that happened. Those four final schools, uh, Pitt, Notre Dame, Syracuse, and Louisville, left in the 13-14 season. So we've had nine college basketball seasons since that happened. In those nine seasons, Villanova has won at least a share of the regular season championship in seven of those nine seasons. Six of those were outright regular season championship. I mean, it's just stupid. It's not quite like what Gonzaga is doing in the West Coast Conference, but it's that type of stuff that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. But Villanova did not win the regular season championship last year. They finished second to the Providence Friars. You'll love to see it. And now (laughs) they bring in a new coach in Kyle Neptune. There's no certainty on Justin Moore's timetable to return or uh, what his abilities will be like when he does get back. And and you're looking at him as like, man, that's got to be our dude this year. You you bring in a freshman in Cam Whitmore who is going to be special, special. Mm-hmm. I cannot wait to watch what he does this season. And man, just Villanova has has it now, right? They've got that it factor. But ultimately, I, I just don't think that's enough with a new coach, a lot of turnover in, in personnel. And so give me Creighton to win mm-hmm. the regular season Big East championship and give me Villanova to, for the first time since in the new Big East to not win back to back regular season titles. I, you know, I love this one. I, I obviously, I, th- I think Villanova is still going to be very good. I, yes. I, I don't want to discount them too much uh, with <laughs> Jay Wright being gone, but, but Creighton, especially you mentioned them, they're su- they have the potential to be a really, really yep. good team yep. this year. They got some questions, yep. you know, they've, they've gotten a lot of hype for not having actually done a ton of it yet on the basketball court. But when you look at Ryan Nemhard, Ryan Kalkbrenner, Arthur Kaluma, like what that team has, who oh boy, they're going to be really, really good. And I think you, you you look around, Xavier is going to be extremely good as well. Sean Miller's in the house there. And I think they got... Yeah, it's great some, to have him back. Yeah, I think they got some really nice pieces there. I think, uh, you know, Providence is still going to be in the picture as well. I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of competition at the top of the Big East. And, and I, I could see Villanova not quite getting back to where they were, uh, which doesn't seem like that much of a shock, but it doesn't happen very often for them uh, in the Big East. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk. I got another player prediction for you. I made one okay. player prediction with Pell Larson in the first segment. Uh, we are talking about another West Coast guard here. This time we are talking about Darian Trammell from San Diego State. Uh, and I think he's going to be an All-American. And I, we talked about bold. We talked about going real bold with this one. I'm not saying first team necessarily, but in the All-American conversation. Uh, and I wanted to give a shout out to Trammell. He came from Seattle U. Uh, Seattle U, a alma mater for your host here. Um, I was where I went to grad school. Uh, but they have churned out guard talent really, really consistently in the last decade or so. It's not a program that has really kind of broken through in a significant way just yet. Uh, they were pretty close to making the NCAA tournament last year in the first full year under head coach Chris Victor after he took over right at the start of the season. But this is a program that has turned in really, really good guards. A great example very recently was Terrell Brown. Terrell Brown scored 20 points per game, was all whack. I think he was WAC player of the year. If not, he was definitely in the WAC first team. He transferred to Arizona, didn't play much at Arizona, transferred again, went back home to Seattle. Instead of going back to Seattle, he went to Washington and he scored 20 points per game for Washington, was all Pac-12 first team player as well. So Seattle U has found this kind of niche of undersized, really, really good scoring guards. And we have seen them be successful uh, outside of outside of the campus at Seattle U. Darian Trammell is next on that list. He averaged 17 and a half points, five assists, four boards, and two and a half steals per game Gosh, for Seattle U last year. He, he would be like the first player you would pick in a college basketball fantasy draft. <laughs> like his numbers are just ridiculous 
all across the board. He's not a great score inside the paint, but he's like 5'10", so that's kind of understandable. A 35% outside shooter. He's also really similar. We talked about like the similarities to Terrell Brown, who went ahead and had a really successful season at Washington. There's also some similarities to Matt Bradley, who went to Cal, was very successful with the Golden Bears, and then transferred to San Diego State. When Matt Bradley did that, we saw he, he went to a better school. He went to a more efficient offense. And lo and behold, his efficiency numbers ticked up. His assist numbers ticked up. Some of the bad stuff kind of ticked down because he went to a better program. Now, mm -hmm. this is Cal to San Diego State. We're talking with Trammell, Seattle U to San Diego State. That's a bigger it's different, difference. Much big difference. It's a, it's a much bigger jump. Uh, and I think assuming he can continue to put up high scoring numbers, we're talking about a guy who's going to average potentially 18, 19 points per game for a top 15 team, a top oh. 20 team. Now, San Diego State yeah. doesn't score a ton. So getting up to 20 points per game might be a little bit of a challenge uh, just because they're they kind of run a bit of a slower paced offense. But if Trammell averages close to 20 points per game, and if San Diego State is remains in the conversation as a top 20 team, you have to be in consideration. There are not a lot of people who no. score 20 points per game for top 20 teams. It just doesn't happen all that often. I don't think that, you know, again, as an undersized guard, certainly there's some limitations to how impactful he can be on the court outside of just as a scorer. But even if that's all he does, if he's really good at that, if he distributes the ball well, I think he's at least puts himself in that conversation. And at the end of the day, all American third team, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibilities for Trammell. And if everything goes together, goes well for him this season at San Diego, man. And, and let's just like, as a team, right beyond, beyond your bold prediction, like the, the basketball gods owe San Diego state for the yes. COVID year, right? And Dayton for that matter, mm -hmm. like the year those two schools were, and I know we could, Mm -hmm. because like Kansas and Baylor were absolutely ridiculous sure. that year too. And so mm -hmm. one of them is probably your national champion, but mm -hmm. like the, the opportunity that, that both San Diego state and Dayton had ripped away from them yeah. that, I mean, just, I, I know this is switching more to Dayton, but just thinking mm -hmm. back to Obi Toppin and what a special yeah. year he had. I remember the Maui championship game, them in Kansas. And it's just um, the basketball world owes San Diego State. Mm -hmm. So please, if one of our six bold predictions comes <laughs> true, maybe, Andy, it could be this one. I would be totally fine with that because I think there's a pretty reasonable chance this is the boldest one that is on here. <laughs> so I would be quite happy if that is the one that ends up to coming together. Yes. All right, folks, we got two more really, really fun bold predictions coming your way in the third and final segment. However... Before we get there, I want to tell you all about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for betting football and the start of the new college basketball season. Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth analysis on every game. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. It is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, segment three here, Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Andy Patton, Isaac Shade, giving you our bold predictions as we are one day into the 2022 23 college basketball season. Isaac cannot wait to hear what you got <laughs> teed up for us on your third and final prediction here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Yes, Andy, love it. Love day two. Thanks for everybody who is already dialed in and joining us. By the way, we want to hear your bold predictions for Absolutely. this season. So for those of you watching on YouTube, drop those down into the comments. For those of you who are listening, uh, you can tweet at us, DM us, email us, whatever it may be. We want to know what you're thinking as well. So Andy, where I'm going to go now is into the national championship realm. Uh, I, I feel like so many people often talk about the Big Ten National Championship drought. But oh, let's not forget the Pac-12 Championship mm -hmm. drought is actually longer. Yep. Um, and so here we go. For those of you who are tracking with us, you can do a little trivia in real time here. <laughs> the last 
Big Ten National Championship was. I hear you screaming. That's right. It's Michigan State way back in 2000. So over two decades since the Big Ten won a national championship. That just doesn't feel right to me, but it's absolutely accurate and true. But the last Pac-12 National Championship goes even further. Arizona in 1997. So we're looking at about 25, 26 years since that has happened. So perhaps this part isn't so bold a prediction. I'm going to say still no national championship this season for either the Pac-12 or the Big Ten. Your your highest ranked preseason Pac-12 school is eight UCLA. They're going to be good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think I think they're not going to be as good as they were last year or the year before, quite frankly. Um, uh, You know, losing Johnny Juzang is huge in that endeavor. But then looking at the Big Ten. Holy smokes, it's even worse. No teams in the preseason top 10. I think Indiana is the highest ranked preseason team for the Big Ten outside the top 10 there. Mm -hmm. So the bold prediction is this. Instead of the Pac-12 or the Big Ten finally getting off the schneid there, we're going to see the Big 12 win their third straight national championship which, friends, also has not happened in a very long time. In fact, since one conference won three straight national championships, you got to go all the way back to the early 90s, Duke in 91 and 92, and North Carolina in 1993. So for the first time since the early 90s, we're going to have a conference with a three-peat national championship. And give me the Baylor Bears as the team to do it. Scott Drew's team winning two of the last three national championships, a la Villanova in the late 2010s. Mm. And that is my third bold prediction. I love it. I, You know, I, I think uh, I'm a Gonzaga person. Gonzaga has been on the scene since 1999. I think that a lot of conversation around Gonzaga is how they have never won a championship. I say, I think I know that is the, <laughs> that is the prevailing conversation around the Zags. And I have found that there aren't a lot of ways to get people to uh, stop engaging with you about that topic. But one way is if they happen to be a fan of a PAC 12 school and you remind them that Gonzaga's in, in terms of like relevancy in the college basketball landscape, Gonzaga's entire existence has been in a time period where the Pac-12 has won zero championships. <laughs> Everything UCLA has done happened before Gonzaga was was a was a topic. I mean, John Stockton was at Gonzaga in the mid '80s, and they had a, a bump in relevancy at that time. But even then, it's not like they became a powerhouse or or, or even did anything significant while he was there. They have been a, a prominent program for 20 years. And in that time period, the Big Ten has won one championship. And it was in the first year that, that Mark Few took over uh, and the Pac-12 hasn't won anything. So I, I those streaks will end at some point. I don't know if sure. either of those streaks will end before Gonzaga's streak ends. Uh, but in the meantime, I am with you 100%. The Big 12 seems like they're just going to keep making a killing with the way that that conference is shaping up right now. Andy, let me ask you. You just said it. What do you <laughs> think happens first? Gonzaga wins a national championship, a Big Ten school wins a national championship, or a Pac-12 school wins a national championship? Man, that is tough. I I don't have a ton of confidence in any of the Pac-12 programs right now, so I yeah. tend to lean towards it being either the Big Ten or I would, Gonzaga. I, I think UCLA is in a good spot, but they don't strike me as a, as a team that's going to compete for a championship this year. Yeah. I don't think they have the depth in the front court. I think that's kind of an issue for them. Uh, Arizona... <laughs> Here, what if UCLA goes to the Big Ten and mm-hmm. and, and breaks the streak oh God, as right. a that member of happen. the Big Ten? <laughs> that could happen. Yes. That would be spectacular. It would be really funny if the Big Ten broke the streak because of UCLA. Yes. I mean, like honestly, if 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 the Pac-12 doesn't do it this year, once UCLA and USC leave, I mean, it's it's going to be up to Tommy and Arizona. It's going to be up to them 100. percent Maybe. Maybe Dana Altman and the Oregon Ducks can break through. I, 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 I'm pretty familiar with their roster yeah. this year. I've watched some practice, and I don't see it for them this year. I think yeah. they're going to be a, a good team. I think Kalel Ware, uh, their new freshman center, is, is very talented, but I, I'm not super confident in any of those programs breaking through. I think somebody in the Big Ten will do it, uh, and I think there's a chance that happens before Gonzaga, but I also think that Gonzaga could end up being a national champion as a member of the Big 12. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe that's the case that ends up <laughs> happening too. 
Yeah, but that I mean, similarly, Gonzaga Gonzaga is going to break through at yes, some point. Will. We know yeah. that. Well, Andy, enough of that talk. I just had to ask you the question because sure. it was it was a great question that mm-hmm. you stumbled onto there. But I want to know your third bold prediction for this college basketball season. Yeah, so I finally decided to break the trend of not doing player focused bold predictions. So this one is actually a team focused prediction. Nice. Uh, we're going back to the Big East. Gotta love talking Big East basketball. And we're talking about a guy we've already talked about a handful of times on the show and in an ad read. And that is Shaheen <laughs> Holloway and yes. Seton Hall. Uh, my prediction for Seton Hall is that they earn a top four seed in the NCAA tournament. Um, it's a pretty bold prediction. Love it. I believe eight, they were they were on the eight nine line last year. I don't remember whether they were an eight or a nine seed, but yeah, I'll look it up while you're talking. Regardless, uh, they were twenty one and eleven last year, so it's not like this is a bad team. They were a good team last year. They're going to be a good good team this year. But the Big East is very very crowded. Holloway is up. He's not a first time head coach, but he is he is moving up a significant level from St. Peter's to coaching uh, at Seton Hall, his alma mater, where he was a superstar player uh, in his time. I think this is going to be a solid team. They did lose two of their best, two of their best scores. They lost both Jared Roden and Bryce Aiken. Those guys each averaged about 15 per game last year. They add a transfer from Clemson, Alamir Dawes. Uh, he averaged about 11 per game last year. He's very, very talented player. Honestly, I think the biggest addition for Seton Hall is, is Shaheen Holloway. I, I, he's a phenomenal coach from an X's and O's perspective, from a player motivation perspective. Uh, defensively, I think some of the stuff that that we saw the Peacocks do was exceptional. And he started getting some attention for that even before they made their deep run in the NCAA tournament. I know J.J. Redick was talking about some of the stuff that St. Peter's was running even before the game against Kentucky and, of course, the, the run against Murray State and Purdue and everybody. Uh, and now you're looking at him getting to kind of implement some of this stuff on a bigger stage uh, at a program he's familiar with, uh, with hopefully buy-in from the players. That's always a big part of it. Uh, he brought Casey Nadifo with him from St. Peter's. He's going to have a nice role. Uh, for the Pirates. I think Dre Davis from Louisville is a nice addition for this team as well. Uh, this is going to be a really good defensive team. <laughs> and I don't know how they're going to score the basketball. <laughs> there the it is. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the prediction's bold for a reason. If I thought Seton Hall was just easily that good enough, then it wouldn't be that bold. But they're going to have to figure out a way to put the ball in the hoop. Uh, and for them to 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 be good enough to earn a top four seed out of the Big East, I mean, you got to be a one of the three or four best teams in the conference in order to be in that conversation. And, you know, we've talked at length about Creighton, about Villanova, Uh, certainly, you know, even schools like Butler and Xavier are going to be in that mix Providence as well. I think Seton Hall's right in that conversation, but they're going to need to find a way to separate themselves into the, like the upper tier of the conference in order to have a real chance of being a top four seed. The way they do that, find somebody who can consistently shoot the rock and knock it down. And right now looking at their roster, I'm not 100% sure who that is, but if they find that guy, if they can be consistent offensively, have a couple guys have breakout seasons on that end of the floor, and Shaheen can put in the, the defensive uh, strategies, the defensive kind of implement his his game plan on that end of the floor, this could be a really dangerous team. Yeah, absolutely. I, Andy, that's fun because, I, I, like you said, we've already talked about the Big East and how loaded it is. Mm-hmm. Um, Shaheen has a great opportunity um, to quickly raise the profile. I think he is a guy that people are going to want to come and play for. So whether it's this year or the years beyond, man, mm-hmm. the, the Big East could be rising back up. Also, by the way, thinking about Seton Hall's schedule, uh, mm-hmm. this is pretty fun. Uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, November 12th, you know who they play? Mm. St. Peter's. Oh, ah, to that's going to be yes. fun. But, but also in the non-conference, they've got Iowa. They've got mm-hmm. Kansas, reigning national mm-hmm. champion. So there's there's some good games in mm-hmm. um, in Seton Hall's uh, non-conference schedule. And so some mm-hmm. great opportunities to see what Shaheen Hallway and his, as you said, defensively-minded team yeah. can do right out of the gate should be a lot of fun to see a coach at his alma mater where we've seen it kind of go both ways. You know, there's some success with uh, people like Hubert Davis. We saw Mm -hmm. last year with, um, at at Michigan, things are Mm -hmm. going pretty well for Mr. Howard, but other places like Patrick Ewing is struggling at Georgetown. So really curious to see how this plays out. Absolutely. They're going to be a team that I'm going to really, really enjoy getting to watch this season. All right. Two episodes down, Mr. Shade. Very, very excited to keep going with the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. I want to thank all of you for giving us a listen as we have gotten this thing going off the ground. 
Thank you all for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen of the day. For your next listen, please check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast, the biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, thank you all for listening. Peace. Peace.